turn them on and set it up against the window right down on the left side of the table while we're sitting at dinner. I, uh, I got to say, it's probably about the first time I've been to church sitting in a restaurant in Florida, but it sure is good. Um, got to go back and watch it again a little later in the week. I appreciate Brother Rich filling in, did a great job. It's good to see him back in the pulpit again. You continue to pray for him and Lisa and the girls and all the family there. You know what they're dealing with. Um, as if the, um, the message wasn't uh, amazing enough and if uh, Lindsay didn't do an amazing enough job singing to look at, at what that family is dealing with, just made it even all the sweeter. It was absolutely great. And I appreciate being here last Wednesday to do that. Um, prayer request, and don't forget 706 884 3100. You can call Miss Sylvia and give her your prayer request, and she can get them on the prayer list, or you can faithforgrains.com, um, faithbc at faithforgrains.com, email, and send them in. <laughs> Also, don't, don't forget to go to faiththegrange.com menu um, and go down and, and go to our prayer list and resources and prayer list and um, make sure that you pray for all of those there. Um, a couple of, of in particular that, that I really want to mention that, that are pressing. Remember Mr. Garvis and the family, uh, Miss Betty McKean. She's not feeling any more pain. Uh, she's not worrying. She's not suffering. She's not having any troubles at all. She is dancing on the streets of gold, walking hand in hand with her Savior, and she's having a time. She's up there waiting on Mr. Garvis. She's learning some best place, but I assure you, he is missing her right here on this earth. And I want to ask if you would to be in prayer for him, that God's grace would hold up him, Lamar, all the family. They're going to need your prayers. I'd ask you to be in prayer for them. Mr. Ron Newton did get to come home. I think it was 21 days in rehab. It was a Pretty good bit of time, but you continue to pray for Mr. Ron. He's still got a long way to go, um, but he is at home, so that, that's a plus. Also, Miss Margaret Bullock called me last night. Um, her sister is in the hospital up in Noonan. She's got lung cancer, and she's not doing very good at all. Um, this, the situation that she painted to me on the phone sounded like a pretty bad situation. I mean, spitting up a good bit of blood, and there's a lot going on there. So I would just ask you to be in prayer. There's certainly many, many others. I don't mean to just narrow it down to those, but that's just three um, that I know that are pressing right off the, the top of my head at the moment. Um, but this evening, we're going to continue our study in the book of 2 Corinthians. As a matter of fact, I, I plan to probably complete the study this evening. There's still a lot there, even in the few passages we'll look at tonight. Um, there, I, I will tell you this, we have in no way exhausted the book of 2 Corinthians. Um, I don't believe if you took any book of the Bible that you could study that book every day for the rest of your life and exhaust any book in the Bible. Uh, it is living water. It is, it is fresh nutrition. It is the Holy Spirit breathing into us. And if you took just one little passage, I don't think you could take a chapter of the Bible and earnestly study it every day and exhaust it within your lifetime because the Bible is so powerful and has so much. So we just kind of done a glancing blow i can tell you this is the 45th lesson on second corinthians so it's kind of amazing you take holidays and some wednesday nights and out of town and and different things that have gone on where we weren't in here on wednesdays that, that we've been in this book for more than a year that doesn't really seem possible but that is a reality because all i label them is lesson one and lesson two and i'm on lesson 45 so um but but i know it's been a good study for me um, I certainly have learned a lot studying it. I have no doubt that I get to learn a lot more than I'm able to portray than what I'm able to teach. I, I love the way God's Word teaches and builds in, but I've, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about how I ought to be in the church. I've learned a lot about the importance of, of being one with everybody in the church. I've learned the importance of not having naysayers. I've learned the importance of never saying anything negative out of your mouth about anybody else in the church because you're speaking negatively against one of God's children. So I've, I've learned a lot of things about the church itself. Paul is dealing with the church, and it's helped me learn a lot of things about the business of the church and things within the church and even how Paul has dealt with things in the church. So I know that it's been good for me. I can only hope and pray that it has been a blessing for you, that you've learned something from it. But we'll pick up tonight in verse number 7. We'll be pretty short. It's pretty brief. There's only 14 verses, and the last four or five of them are the salutations, the signing off, going away. Um, and we've already covered 7 and 8 a little bit uh, two weeks ago. But we'll pick up verse number 7. I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, 
and though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. When we are glad, when we are weak, it says, For when we are glad, when we are weak, and ye are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Father, thank you for this letter, God. Thank you for what you've handed to us. I know you wrote it through the hand of the Apostle Paul and you mailed it to the church at Corinth. You had Titus hand deliver it there to that church, but you preserved it for 2,000 years and your Holy Spirit has hand delivered it to 552 Hammett Road, to Faith Baptist Church, God, that you might teach us. I pray you'd open our hearts, our minds, our ears, that we might learn something, God. I pray that you'd teach us in this time that we're in, God. COVID-19 is no mistake. It's no accident. It's not even a negative. It's a positive. You're doing something, God. I believe you're doing something in the church. I believe you're doing something in the country. I believe you're trying to do something in our lives if we just get out of the way and let you, God. I pray you'd take this tonight. I pray you'd open some things up, God. I pray you'd help us to learn that we might be more pleasing to you. We love you, God. You've been so good to us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul says here in verse number 7, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest. The only thing the Apostle Paul wants right here is for the church to do right, for the people in the church to do right, for the membership, the body of believers, even at the expense of his own reputation. Now you think about the letter. We've been looking at the letter and how Paul has said several sharp comments and talked about things coming. And in the letter, he, he's talked about how people are making accusations against him. And one of the accusations that they're making against him is they say, Oh, yeah, he writes sharp. He writes hard things. He writes big and bold things. But when he comes, he won't do anything. He, he'll do nothing. So that's what they're already saying. In this letter, Paul says that when I come, I'm coming with the power and with the authority of an apostle. He said, I am an apostle. He has the apostolic powers, and he says, if necessary, I will show you those apostolic powers when I come. He says, this time, it's not going to be the laying on of hands. It's not going to be the healing of the sick or maybe even sight to the blind or whatever miracles he did the first time when he went there when he mentioned that they saw great apostolic powers. He said, this time, it's going to be different. It's not going to be the healing and the joys. This time, it's going to be things of judgment. He says, if. If those in the church will set their own house in order, then Paul won't have to do anything. If they'll just take care of these matters themselves, if they'll just get the house in order, get the church in order, get the naysayer silence, if they'll just take care of those things, Paul says, I won't have to do anything at all if everything's already taken care of. But now the other side of that is if Paul doesn't do anything, if Paul doesn't have to use any apostolic powers, how much fuel is that going to add to the naysayers who already say he writes these harsh letters, he, he says these sharp things, but when he comes he'll do nothing. Now here he is again writing a sharp letter. How much fuel will it add to the fire to those that say, see, I told you when he got here he wasn't going to do anything, but Paul's not worried about them. Paul's not worried about his reputation. He's not worried about what people have to say. He's not worried about what people think about him. He is worried about the spiritual well-being of the church, the, the spiritual strength of the individuals within the church, each one of the members. Paul is concerned for their spiritual health. What the naysayers want to say, let them talk. See, Paul, when it comes to Paul in the church at Corinth, a, a great opposite of that would be the story of Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah? God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. The Ninevites were, were living in sin. They had all kind of sin and idolatry and things going on and wickedness. And God was going to destroy them. He said, go tell them that judgment is at hand. Go tell them to repent or I'm going to bring judgment. Jonah says, I'm not doing that. I don't even like those people. 
You know how hard they are on people like me? They hate the Jews. Why would I go warn them, just bring judgment? God says, go tell Nineveh to repent or judgment's coming. Jonah says, that ain't happening. I'll get on a boat and head down to Tarshish. I'll just go the opposite direction. So he got on a boat and thought he'd do what Jonah wanted to do because he didn't like those people. He didn't want those people to repent. He didn't care anything about it. He didn't want to tell them the judgment was coming. But, you know, the story, God sent the storm, the boat was tossed, and they cast lots to find out who was causing the problem. Lots fell on Jonah. Jonah got tossed in. God had him swallowed up with the great fish. The fish carries him back, spits him out on the shores of Nineveh. I have no doubt God said, now you get, boy. And he took off. The Bible says that he ran down the streets shouting, repent. Judgment is coming. Repent. Judgment is coming. Repent. Judgment is coming. See, that is exactly what Paul wants here. The people of the, of the city of Nineveh, they repented. They turned from their wicked way. They turned away from it, and God did not bring judgment. That's what Paul wants for Corinth. He loves these people. He wants to see them do well now. Jonah, on the other hand, Jonah was ticked off. The Bible says in chapter 4 and verse number 1 that it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was very angry and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well? To be angry? Jonah's mad because these people have mistreated Jonah and all of his friends, all of those like him, and, and abused them all this time. He don't like them at all, and he doesn't think that God's grace ought to be given to them. But in a time like that, it's really good for you and I to remember that the same grace that forgave them is the same grace that forgave us. They may deserve hell, but so do we. They may not deserve grace and mercy, but that's why it's called grace and mercy. So Jonah's ticked off, and God says, what are you mad about? The same thing that's available to you is available to them, is available to them, is available to you. It's the same grace. But, but Jonah says, I, I didn't... I didn't want to see that. I told you if I went and told them they'd repent and that you'd forgive them. And he says, now I look like an idiot. See, he's worried about his reputation. I look like an idiot because I went and told them what you told me to tell them. I went and told them that judgment was coming and nothing happened. So now he's all worried about his own reputation. But, but the reason nothing happened is because they repented from what they were doing wrong. Boy, that'd be a really good spot to stop right here and preach on COVID-19 for a while, wouldn't it, Joseph? It'd be a really good time to stop. Let's talk about all the problems in the church and all that's going on, and everybody sees all this as such a negative. I'm sorry. You can disagree with me. You want to. I don't see it as a negative. I see it as a positive. I see God putting some people to a stop. I see some families spending time together. I see some people seeking God. I see some people wanting to come to church that ain't wanting to come to church for a while. I see some people dying to get in here that you didn't come the last three Sundays before COVID-19 started. I see some. I ain't got time to preach on that. I'm sorry, Joseph. Let me get back to my mom. It'd be a really good time to stop right there and preach a message on God doing something in the church. God has a right to shake some things up and get some attention. But, but Jonah has been out of shape. Paul, on the other hand, he's not worried about his reputation. He's not worried about what people think about him. He loves those in the church. All he wants is to see them get right with God. All he wants is to see them grow in their relationship with God. He doesn't care if it costs him a little bit of reputation and people want to laugh. He just wants to see them grow in their walk with the Lord. He knew that if he didn't have to do anything, that that would mean that they had become one with God. If he didn't have to do any apostolic powers, if he didn't have to do any things that he promised, if he didn't have to bring any judgment, that would be because they got their heart right with God. They cleaned up their own house. They cleaned up the church. They got rid of the naysayers. They brought everything back in line with God. And that's all he wants for the church is to get back in line with God. Paul's not the least bit worried about his reputation. Reputation and character are two totally different things. Reputation is what people think about us. Reputation is what we have, but character is who we are. Reputation can be ruined. People can tell lies about you that aren't even true and ruin your reputation. People can stir around stuff and ruin your reputation. People can make other people think negative things about you by making up stuff that ain't even true and ruin your reputation. 
Nobody can ruin your character but you. Reputation is what people think we are. Character is what God knows that we are. Reputation is what people see, but our character is what God sees. Character is who we are in the dark. Character is who we are when nobody else is looking, and that is the thing that God looks down. Paul's not worried here about his reputation. His character is in the right place. His character is right before God. He, all he's worried about is seeing God's children do the right thing and get in line with the will of God. Put things in order. Do what they're supposed to do. And then Paul won't have to use any power. Paul won't have to bring any judgment. That would just tickle Paul to death. He don't want to bring any judgment on these people. He don't even want to bring judgment on the ones that are causing the problem. He wants them to get right with God. Even the ones that are sowing discord. Even the ones that are nagging. Even the ones that are doing the complaining. Even the ones that are stirring the pot. Even the ones that are causing the problems. Even the ones that are making the accusations. Paul doesn't want to bring judgment on any of them. He wants them to get right with God. That is his desire for all of mankind. He just wants the church to deal with the problems themselves before he gets there so that he won't have to. Verse number 9 and 10. Paul says, here's what I wish. We are glad when we're weak and you're strong. This also we wish even your profession. Paul says, we're glad when we're weak. We rejoice in your well-being. We are more than willing to deny ourselves if it promotes spiritual strength in you. It doesn't matter what happens to us. We just want to see you grow and you walk with the Lord. What he's saying is, is I don't mind appearing weak. It doesn't matter to me that I don't show the powers. To show the powers means that I had to take care of some things. I don't mind that, that I uh, appear weak rather than having to bring judgment down on you. What I wish for, I wish that you will put all things in order so that I don't have to. Whoever's causing the problem, whatever the, whoever's sowing the discord within the church, whoever's stirring the things up, either get them right, or get them out. Can I tell you that, that it's very much okay? Some people might have to sometimes be put out of a church. If, they, if they're going to be... There's some people set on some pews that aren't Christians. There's some people set on some pews, I believe, are driven by the devil. All they do is constantly stir the pot and stir the stuff. Well, I don't have time to preach on that either, Joseph. I'm going to wind up getting off out of this yet. I'm just trying to do this little bit of seven little verses right here. If I just stay right here, seven little verses, I'm going to wind up preaching before I get all out of here in a minute. <clears throat> Whoever's causing the problem, he says, get them in line or get them out of the church. The word that Paul uses here for perfection, it carries the idea of something being brought to maturity or being restored to its original condition. That's what Paul wants for the church. Grow up. Brought to maturity. I want perfection in you. It means grow up. Quit acting like children. Quit wanting to be spoon-fed. Quit crying for your bottle of milk. Grow up. That's what he's telling the church. Get some people out. And, and then be restored to its original condition. When you got saved, you're on fire for a little while. Your heart was in the right place for a little while. You sought God for a little while. But then you begin to stray a little here. You begin to stray a little there. And now you've got way off over here in left field. you got all this going on. You're more worried about what color the carpet is than you are whether or not God shows up. You're more worried about whether or not you get your seat and get out by 12 o'clock than you are about whether or not a soul gets saved on Sunday morning. You're more worried about whether or not you get to part where you want to then whether or not somebody's burdens is lifted and a marriage is restored and a family's put together and god says i want you to be restored paul says to this church i want you to be restored to your original state back to the moment when you first got washed in the blood when you first got saved at that moment you were sin free because you just got washed in the blood but you made a mess out of that and this is what i want is to see the church i want to see you get back to the place of its original condition verse number 10 therefore i write these things being absent lest being present i should use sharpness according to the power which the lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction so paul says the reason that i write these things the reason i'm having to make these things known to you now in this letter is because i desire for you to fix them before i come 
Otherwise, when I get there, I'll be forced into having to use this power which God has given me through Jesus Christ himself in a face-to-face -face meeting. Jesus Christ gave me this power. He says, so I write in sharpness. I, I write this letter in some harshness. I write this letter to cut so that it'll fix some things. I write in sharpness so that hopefully I can come in peace. I, I write some hard stuff so hopefully I can come in fellowship. I, I write some things to straighten out so that hopefully, hopefully I can, can come in a time of, of love and gathering and, and not have to come in sharpness. My hope is that this letter will fix things and that you will turn back to Christ and you'll get some things right. He says, you know, there's two ways of doing this. You get it right before I come or I'm going to have to get it right when I come. That, you know, there's two ways of doing a lot of things. And a whole lot of different things. There's, there's multiple ways. But if you take two ways to accomplish the same thing, usually one of those ways is going to be easier. One of those ways will be less painful. One of those ways will have uh, less downtime, have less recovery time. One of those ways will be less invasive. I, I, was, think, I was trying to think about different ways of doing things and, and, and the, the great difference between them. And this was about the best I can think of. My dad had some heart problems in 1991. And in December of 1991, my dad had three blockages. And they had to go in and do open heart surgery. They had to cut here, break the rib cage open, go in, go into the heart, do a triple bypass surgery, put him back together. I remember my dad. It's the year that my son was born. Matter of fact, he put the surgery off until Corey was born to go have the surgery done because he wanted to see Corey before he had the surgery just in case. You know, when it's your own family, it's a lot different than it is when it's somebody else's family. When it's your life, it, it's a whole lot scarier than when it's somebody else. So my dad went and had the triple bypass, and I remember the recovery. It took forever. There's probably still some repercussions here. My dad was 60 years old at the time, and there's probably still some things that go on from that surgery but I remember, man, it was for years. I remember we'd be doing stuff. My dad would get winded for the longest time, or sometimes things would hurt. There, there was a, a price to be paid for that surgery to fix it. Now, my dad has had a few blockages since then. He's had a few different problems, but now they go in with that camera, and they run that camera up, and they find the spot. They find the blockage, and then they run a stand up in there. They open up the passageway. They let the blood get through. Now, the open heart surgery is still available. They can still go into the heart. They can still do a triple bypass. They can still do it exactly the way they did, or they can take another way. There's two ways of doing that now. One of them is less painful. One of them is a lot quicker. One of them will get you home tomorrow. The other one will have you healing up for years to come. That's kind of what Paul is talking about right here to the church. He says there, there may be two different ways. One way is for you to go ahead and take care of this now. I'm sending you the letter to make you aware of the things that are going on. I'm sending you the letter to let you know that this, this junk going on in the church needs to be straightened out. And it's going to be a whole lot better if you take care of it before I have to come and take care of it myself. That's another good spot to time out and start talking about some COVID-19, isn't it? Paul says, according to the power which the Lord hath given me. The word that Paul uses here for power in the text, it means that he has both, now listen now, this is this one word, power, this word power. It means that he has the ability and the authority. The ability does you no good if you don't have the authority. The authority does you no good if you don't have the ability. He says, I have the power. And what that word means simply is the power has been gifted to me along with the permission to use it. I have both. Don't think that I don't. Don't make me come there. The word that he uses for destruction there at the end of the sentence, it means to pull down by force. Paul says, I have the ability and I have permission to pull pull you down by force if that's what it takes. So, so Paul leaves them here with no doubt. If you don't straighten this mess out, I will. If you don't put a stop to the foolishness in the church, I will. If you don't put a silence to the naysayers in the church, I will. If you don't stop those that are sowing discord within the church, 
I will. But if I have to do it, you're not going to like it because some of you are going to wind up in it too because you should have done it before I got here and it wouldn't have had to have fallen on you. It would have just fallen on the troublemakers. And then he says in verse number 11, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. There's actually a good bit of teaching in the salutations here in these last three or four, but I'm not going to spend a lot of, of time on them. But that word there, he says, be perfect, that is a derivative from the same word that we looked at a while ago as perfection. It means to be complete, to be um, repaired, and be restored to original condition. And the love of, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Now that word there, for love is agape and that is that unconditional never-ending love that god has for us that that deep affection the word there for peace it can also be translated as prosperity he says greet one another with an holy kiss now somebody needs to pay close attention to this this one little bit right here because sometime very soon we're going to get to come back to church and we're all going to get to come back together. It's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be sit, parking in some different places and sitting in some different places. I don't care. For a while, I had a really bad attitude. You mean we're going to have to park every other space? I'm going to have to block off every other pew? We're going to have to wear a mask? Now all I'm thinking is, praise God. All we got to do is park in every other place. All we got to do is close every other pew. All we got to do is put on a mask, and we get to come into the house of God and worship. We get to praise Him. I don't care what we got to do. We get to come in. I got a whole new attitude in the last couple of weeks about getting to come back to church. I'm just glad we get to come back. I don't care if we got to wear a full mask or a hazmat suit. As long as I get to come back to the church, don't matter what it is. We could be in China where you can't go to church. We could be in China where if they caught you in church, they put you in prison or kill you. We could be in a place where church is forbidden. So we're going to have to do a little bit of this uncomfortable. Kind of goes back to last Sunday's message why I preached it. We're going to find out who comes here to see who's who, and we're going to find out who wants to worship God because someday soon we're going to get to open the doors and we're going to get to come back and worship but things are going to be a little bit different so I was looking at the verse and I thought Lord Lord that says greet one another with the with a holy kiss well, well I got to look and that word greet it means to enfold in your arms so the Bible says hug somebody matter of fact it means to embrace one another so so the Bible is clearly telling me there that, that I'm doing all right when I, when I hug on brothers and sisters in Christ and, and love on people. That word for holy means pure or ceremonial. But then I kind of run into a problem. Now, I know God's word is perfect. But that word for kiss right there, you know what it means? It means kiss. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you come kissing on me. Me and you ain't going to get along. There's they, they, they some things that I can handle, but that ain't one of them. I don't care how holy you think your kiss is. You keep your kissing for your husband, your wife, or somebody else. You keep, you keep your lips off of me. I don't care what that text says. <laughs> what do you think, Joe? Joe's up there going, uh-uh. Don't be kissing on me either. We're in agreement. We're two or more agree. We're in agreement. You don't come kissing on the two of us, but we got a bigger problem than that. When we come back together, there's still going to be some shelter in place. There's still going to be some six foot. And, and people go, and I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I want to hug somebody. I'm, I'm ready to hug on some folks. Man, I'm ready to see some folks. But you know what? Sometimes you got to love people enough to get past yourself. Um, right now, if we really love each other, and, and you really love the person around, you can prove that by staying six foot away from them for a few more weeks till we get past all this stuff. Because what I don't want to do is come in here and have a big old fellowship time, get all together, and be like those two churches up in North Georgia got to come for one week, and people in their congregation came up with COVID-19. Now those entire churches are on a 14-day, what do you call that, Philip? Quarantine. They're on a 14-day quarantine. Everybody was in church because they got too close together and did it all. I, I don't want to be in that. And they said they went by the rules, did some stuff, but I don't want to be in all that. But, but I can tell you this. We can love them just the same. We, to, to love them is to love them with the heart. The hug doesn't mean I love you. The hug is just a sign of it. But we can come together, and we can have a great time in the Lord. 
Paul says to greet one another with a holy kiss. And then he says, all the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost. That word communion right there, it means partnership or fellowship. What that tells me is I have a partnership and a fellowship with the Holy Ghost of God. If I have a partnership and a fellowship with the Holy Ghost, then I have a partnership and a fellowship with Jesus Christ the Son, which means I have a partnership and I have a fellowship with God the Father. He says, <clears throat> he, he says, as the children of God, we have a fellowship, and we see the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Ghost. Where in the world did that verse go? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the communion of the Holy Ghost, be with you all. I couldn't even find my place in my nose. I knew I'd put that verse in there somewhere. The Lord be with you all. And then he says, Amen. Paul wrote a letter to the church. Thirteen chapters of a very pointed letter. There, there was a stretch through there about midway where, man, he got to doing some patting on the back and some praise, and I had a really good time teaching that. But for a lot of it, he's dealt with issues. He, he's dealt with, with problems. And, and God saw fit to preserve this for 2,000 years to hand it down and personally hand it to Faith Baptist Church in LaGrange, Georgia, and any other church and any other person that is willing to open that book and read it. Paul has a pointed letter designed by the Holy Spirit on the church, and this is what God says to the church through the hand of Paul. I love you. I just want you to do right. I just want to have a good relationship with you. I don't want to have to rebuke you. I don't want to have to come down and chasten you, but, but whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. As a father chases his children, God God will chase them. I don't want to have to spank your backside. Moms and dads can understand this. We didn't spank our children because we wanted to. We spanked them because we had to. Because you had to teach them right from wrong. They, they had to learn what they could and couldn't do. God says, I, I, I don't want to have to come down and straighten the church out. I wouldn't doubt they don't say, I didn't want to have to send COVID-19, but I had to do something to get your attention. I had to do something to cause you to want to get back to I had to do something to cause you to have a desire to get back to church. I had to do something that gave you a drive and made you say, Oh, Lord God, if we could just get back in the church. Instead of saying, Oh, is it Sunday again already? I wouldn't doubt that God saying, I didn't really want to send that. But I can tell you this, that's about the nicest thing I can do. I'm just giving you a little time, but you don't want to see what I can do. I always suggest you go ahead and take care of some internal issues. I would suggest you go ahead and get your heart focused back and get some things in line with me and do some things yourself so that I don't have to use any other powers. I believe God's speaking to his church through all this. I believe God's got a plan, and I believe there's a great opportunity for the church to grow in places that we've not grown, do things that we've not done, and reach people we've not reached. But it's up to us. I believe the next step falls in our hands. Well, I don't have time to get off and preach on all that either. I'm just going to end that letter for right now. Um, probably we'll, we'll go into a different line of uh, a different book, a different study next week. I'll be in prayer. I don't know. There's a few more things in this salutation here in the last few verses we might could look at, but, but I'll be in prayer. Um, in the meantime, I, I hope you have an amazing rest of your week. I hope to see all of you right here Sunday morning, faithofgrange.com for live stream. Um, something don't happen, the Pembertons will be with us Sunday morning. They'll be over here on the piano. Have some live singing. I'm excited about them being back. And yes, I'd kind of line some things up expecting to be back live in church, but that's okay. We're going to go on live with what we got. Um, but you continue to pray for us. And we're going to continue to pray for you. God bless you. We love y'all.